Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new to the channel or you are sitting in the back row still listening and haven't done so already, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and then set that notification bell to all. That way you get the reminder of every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee or if you would like to learn how to become a member, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, and that will be played. I will read the first story, and that will be played. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Okay, so I have to tell a story that my mom told me a while back. It was her first experience with a Ouija board, and my mom wouldn't make something like this up. The whole reason she even told me about it was because I brought up the idea of using one to contact a younger brother who passed away. Anyway, her story freaked me out enough to never, ever use one. Back when she was in high school, late one night, her and a group of friends were cruising around on gravel roads a few miles outside of town. I live in a small town in Iowa and they stopped at an old abandoned farm and decided to whip out an old Ouija board one of her friends had. My mom had a really bad feeling right off the bat and said she wasn't going to do it. Well, everyone kept calling her a sissy and saying it won't work unless everyone who was there plays. So my mom was convinced, but on one condition. She played if they didn't ask sketchy questions. One of the guys laughed it off and made the promise not to. So they all gathered around on the floor of the barn and placed their hands on the planchette of the board. They asked some basic questions about, Is there anyone here? What's your name? Things like that. No response. Then a guy named Terry asked, Which one of us will be the first to die? And my mom pulled her hands off the board and said, That is not funny. She was super pissed and everyone screamed at her to put her hands back on the board. As soon as she put her hands back on, the piece moved and spelt out the initials of a boy who was there. CJ. I can't remember his last name. And he has a twin. His twin was also present and that really didn't matter. After this, they said goodbye because they were all freaked out and my mom was pissed and everyone was blaming each other for moving the piece around the board. So anyway, they all went home and basically forgot about the whole thing. Years later, CJ was out driving on a gravel road when he ended up crashing into the ditch and dying. The first one out of everyone there. And the creepy thing is that when the police were done investigating the crash, they said the tire flew off because somebody purposefully loosened the lug nuts on his tire. So, ever since she told me that story, I've been too scared to try using it by myself. Before I begin, I would just like to clarify that this is a true experience. I used to live in a building that had eight separate flats in it. I didn't interact much with the other people in the building except for the guy who lived next door to me. One of the nicest guys I've ever met. And the guy who lived directly below me. I immediately noticed when I moved in that the guy below me was the opposite of a considerate neighbor. He blasted music at all hours of the night, sometimes for 24 hours straight. Honestly, though, I could sleep through a hurricane and it genuinely didn't bother me that much, except for the fact that it was super rude. Anyway, I opted to keep the peace and not mention it. 
The guy who lived next door to me, Gary, approached me one day and asked if I was okay about the guy below me playing his music so loud, because even Gary could hear it in his flat. I told him I wasn't too bothered by it, and Gary said he was relieved because he didn't want me confronting the guy on my own. I'm a 20-year-old girl, and Gary was about 50, so I think he was just looking out for me. I asked why, and he said that he'd met the guy years beforehand through work, and he'd introduced himself as John. But when he moved into the flat, he introduced himself as Wes. Gary had gone back to one of the other guys who'd worked with him to double check, and he said he'd switch between two personalities regularly, so he obviously had some form of personality disorder. I'm hardly any expert on stuff like that, but I'd hear Wes, that's the name my boyfriend and I ended up using to refer to him, yelling quite a lot, and I wondered if maybe he played the music to drown out the voices or something. I might be way off the mark. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Anyway, one day I find a note taped to my door. Stop your constant banging. I can't sleep. You can tell from the handwriting that it's been scrawled in a fury. Now, I was at work. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And when I got home, I pretty much sat on my sofa all night. Obviously, I made tea and went to the bathroom too, but I definitely wasn't constantly banging. Anyway, Wes took it upon himself to start banging on his roof, which is my floor, whenever he felt like I was being too loud. And that's how I knew it wasn't me, because he'd bang at the most random times when I hadn't moved from the sofa for over an hour or sometimes at like 4 a.m. when I'd been in bed for hours. My boyfriend knocked on his door a few times, but he would never answer. This is where it gets creepy. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts, to be completely honest, so I never thought much of the weird noises. I heard in that flat, I was living in a building with seven other people after all, in hindsight, my boyfriend said some weird things in his sleep, too, but he sleep-talks random nonsense regularly anyway. Despite me not believing in ghosts, I do find it super interesting, and I have a Ouija board, which I occasionally try out. Despite me not believing in ghosts, I do find it super interesting, and I have a Ouija board, which I occasionally try out. One night, my boyfriend and I decided to use it. We'd already used it once before in that flat, but nothing happened. This time, however, it did. Mostly, it was moving to random letters that made no sense, but I was still feeling a weird vibe. The candles kept flickering, which I know sounds weak, but I just had a really weird feeling about the situation for some reason. Anyway, then the board says F. I-N-D-M, me. So I naturally ask, where are you? And it says, W-E-S-H-I-D-B-O-D-Y. Like an absolute idiot, I read that as, we shed body, and hastily concluded that the board was talking nonsense and goodbye and turn the lights on. To be completely honest, I was getting really freaked out. I thought I could hear things moving, and I didn't want my boyfriend to see how creeped out I was, because he believes in ghosts, and I'm always super skeptical about it. Only afterwards, sat on the sofa, did I realize it had actually been saying, Wes hid body. When the realization hit me, I told my boyfriend, whose reaction was, Oh, I see. Very funny. <laughs> nice try. To this day, he thinks I was pushing the board and playing dumb to make it more realistic. But it wasn't. Out of curiosity, I tried to look up local murders or disappearances, but I couldn't find anyone. I also can't find any social media for... Wes or anything of interest about him online. I managed to find out his real name. 
I still don't know what happened or why the board said that. I'm convinced there's a logical explanation. Subconscious movements, maybe? But it freaked me the hell out. On a side note, how fuming would that ghost have been at me, sitting there saying, Wes hid body? <laughs> that makes sense. I moved out of that flat a couple of months ago. Not gonna lie, I'm not using that Ouija board ever again. Buckle up, everyone. Here comes a really long story. I know people will hear my story and probably either think I'm full of shit or just flat out crazy. I'm going to tell it anyway because I think people should be aware of the danger they're putting themselves in, playing what they believe is a game. It's not a game for all people at all times. I don't know if some people just draw negative energies and entities to them, or if it has more to do with the location they are used to when negative entities show up. Children are more open to those types of things, and they haven't yet developed the skills to block out those things yet. I'm not like most parents. When my children told me that they were scared of the dark, I always took them seriously. I never told them monsters weren't real, and I never told them that it's just their imagination because I know that sometimes it's not. Some people are more open to things that most others aren't. That's the real problem with this, unfortunately. Some people just can't grasp that things they can't explain, one, possibly, be real. They tell themselves that there is a rational explanation when sometimes there isn't. On to the story. When I was 10 or 11 years old, I had a neighbor who lived up the street who had a Ouija board. Our friend group all were extremely interested in it once she told us about it. The four of us walked to her house and retrieved it. We brought it back to my house and took it in the basement where my bedroom was. My bedroom was always dark and damp. It was borderline scary on a good day without a Ouija board present and for curious kids. We sat on the floor and all placed our hands on the planchette. We started asking questions and within a few minutes, the planchette started moving. We all started accusing each other of being the one who moved it. To prove that we weren't the culprit, we all started just barely touching the planchette, barely making contact with it, to prove to each other that we were not the one who was moving it. Here's where I believe we all went so wrong. We started asking dumb questions like, who was Jack the Ripper? Can Jack the Ripper come through and give us your name? Yeah, I know that was dumb, but we were children, and we believed that we could solve the mystery with a little help from the other side. We didn't stop to consider that what we were asking was very dark, and we were inviting dark forces by asking dark questions, all while sitting in a dark and somewhat scary room. We also didn't know the rule about always making sure to say goodbye and have whatever you've made contact with say goodbye as well. Basically, we opened a door we didn't know we opened, and we left it open because we didn't know any better. Nothing happened right away, but we did continue to play the Ouija board in my house every single day for weeks, trying to get the answer and solve the mystery of the true identity of Jack the Ripper. The weirdest thing that happened while using the board was just the planchette moving even though we were all touching it so lightly we were hardly touching it at all. Of course we all believed that one of us was moving it and we all kept blaming each other and we all vehemently denied it was one of us because it wasn't. Nothing really weird happened until after everyone went home and didn't really start until we had used it for at least a week. The reason we picked my house in the first place is because I already knew something there. As a small child, I used to see apparitions walking 
They were all harmless, but the one that showed up after using the Ouija board wasn't. I know that's hard for a lot of people to believe, but I'm not going to let that stop me from telling my story because it may actually help someone else make a better decision for them, or at least their children. I'm understanding of being skeptical of things that you weren't personally experienced yourself. I'm just understanding of the fact that most people aren't susceptible to these sorts of things, and most people will never have a clue that they're even there at all. I'm not here to convince anyone of anything because I already know most people just can't grasp what I'm about to say, and that's fine with me. It didn't take long before I started seeing a giant three-dimensional shadow shaped mostly like a human in my living room at night. It would watch me from the corner of my room. Sometimes I would see it walking past my bedroom door. I always left it open at night because I was down there all by myself. My mother and grandmother were both upstairs. When we went downstairs at the bottom of the stairs was a bar with a sink and a refrigerator. To the right was a large family room. To the left was a door that took you to the laundry room and utility room. And there was also a bathroom in there. That was the darkest place in the house because there were no windows at all back there. It was like a really true, creepy, horror-looking basement. The house was a story and a half. It was built on a hill, so from the front, it looked like it was one story. From the back, it looked like it was two stories. If you went right at the bottom of the stairs and walked through the family room, there were two bedrooms behind the family room. You had to walk through the first bedroom to get to my bedroom, which was behind it. One used to be mine, and the other was my brother's but he moved in with our dad, so I sort of took over both rooms, but my bed was in the one in the very back. One night, I was in the family room playing with army men and listening to Guns N' Roses on my cassette player. The door to the laundry and utility room was open, and the lights were off in there. I had been telling my mom and grandma for weeks that something was down there, and I wanted to move to the extra bedroom upstairs but it was used for storage, so I wouldn't have been able to clean it out. They didn't believe me, and they didn't want to go through the trouble of cleaning it out. My grandmother was very Catholic, and the thought of anything supernatural was just utterly nonsense to her. As I was playing with my army men, I heard a deep growl from the utility room. It was so loud, it felt like it shook the ground, and I swear I even saw my army men vibrate a little. The worst part was the only way to get upstairs was either by running up the stairs, which meant I had to run right past the utility door, or go out of the back door and around the house in the middle of the night, and I didn't have a key. I chose the upstairs and ran right past the utility room. I made it upstairs and everyone was sleeping. I went into my mom's room and slept on the floor by her bed. The following morning she got up and woke me up and asked me why I was sleeping on her floor. I told her what happened and she laughed at me. At breakfast I told my grandmother and she also laughed at me. She told me it was just the furnace. I didn't even bother pointing out the obvious. It was the middle of summer and we weren't using the furnace. I tried telling them both that and I had lived there for most of my life and I knew what the damn furnace sounded like. Anyway, they couldn't imagine that what I was telling them could be true or real. I couldn't go into my bedroom without feeling like I was being watched. Every time I walked up the stairs, I felt like someone was right behind me breathing on my neck. I would catch glimpses of it every time I was downstairs. Sometimes out of the corner of my eye, sometimes a shadow walking back and forth in front of my door. And, worst of all, at night or when the lights were off downstairs, I would see it directly. It was always darker than dark blacker than black glaring at me. I never could clearly see its face, but I could feel it staring at me. 
It was so tall, it looked like its head was touching the ceiling. It was even plaguing my dreams, no matter if I slept upstairs or not. Every child thinks they would scream for their parents if they saw a monster, but it doesn't work that way. When you are actually face to face with something like this, and you feel concerned and trapped knowing you can't get away, and screaming isn't an option, you will be frozen with fear completely and unable to move as well. The only time I wasn't frozen was when I had a way to get out from it. When it was standing over my bed at night, I knew it was between me and the door. I couldn't function at all. The most I could do was pull the covers over my head and pray. I would eventually gain the courage to take a peek, and if it was gone, I would run up to my mom's room as fast as possible. After so many weeks of her waking up every morning and finding me on the floor, she finally decided to switch rooms with me. The first night, everything was fine. The next morning, I asked her how it was, and she laughed. The second night, maybe two or three in the morning, I got woken up by her climbing in bed beside me. I asked her what was going on, and her exact words were, You were right. There's something down there. I'm going to clean out the other room up here. I'm never sleeping down there again. My grandmother's room was right above my old bedroom, which was made into the new storage room after we cleaned out the other bedroom upstairs. One night, it was just me and her in the house. My mom went out for the night. I went to bed, and at some point later in the night, I got woken up by my grandmother. She was standing over my bed with a big-ass butcher knife. I thought she was going to try and kill me at first, but she said, Josh, Josh, get up. I need your help. Someone broke in. I could hear them moving around in your old bedroom. I told her to call the police, but she told me they wouldn't get there fast enough. She led me to the kitchen and handed me a knife as well, and told me to follow her to the basement. I stayed behind her the entire time because I didn't know what we were going to find down there. We crept down the stairs as quietly as possible and made our way through the first bedroom. We got to the door of my old bedroom and she yelled through the door, We know you're in there. Leave now. There's two of us and we're both armed. She threw the door open and flipped on the light. We looked around the room and nothing had been disturbed. Everything was as it should have been. She had a very confused look on her face. She looked at me and said, I know I heard something. I know I'm not crazy. Please don't tell your mom about this. I, I don't know what she'll think. I knew what she had heard, but didn't even bother telling her what I thought she heard. She couldn't believe it anyway. I know people will probably think that the things I saw were caused by sleep paralysis or night terrors. I would see it during the day before ever going to bed. One time, a whole group of us saw it in the middle of the day, but it wasn't in my house. It was in the woods behind my house. It was the same group of kids that used to Ouija board with me. They were people I hung out with every day. There is a creek behind the house and on the other side is a small patch of woods. We were playing in the woods by the creek. I don't know what prompted me to say it, but I said, What would you guys do if there was a monster in the woods? Right after I said that, my friend said, What's that guy doing? At the top of the hill, there was what first appeared to be a man walking a dog. He was pacing back and forth between two trees that were about ten feet apart. We were looking uphill at it, and the sun was in our eyes, so we all walked a little closer to get a better look. When we got close enough, we could see that it wasn't a man walking a dog. It was a three-dimensional walking shadow. It had four legs, but a human-looking torso. When it knew we all could clearly see it, the thing stopped and turned towards us. As usual, I couldn't believe my eyes, but I could feel it glaring at us. It had ears that stuck out of the side of its head like cat ears. 
It turned towards us and charged right at us. We ran like our lives depended on it. We ran straight through the creek and didn't even bother looking back to see if my friends were all with me. We ran straight to my house and in the back door. My brother was there and he was about to walk out the back door as we barreled through it together. We nearly took him off his feet. He still remembers us running in and freaking out telling him we got chased by something in the woods. That thing was invited by us because of that damn Ouija board. It messed with me for years. I was its chosen target. I eventually took my power back and told it. I was done allowing it to scare me. I got rid of it. When I was a teenager, I moved back into my old home. I used to have dreams where I would be in my bedroom. The light would shut off and I would run to the door, but it wouldn't slam shut when I got there. I would grab the doorknob and it wouldn't open. I would try to flip on the light switch and it wouldn't work. In my panic, I could hear it behind me laughing at me. I would be too scared to turn around. The last time I had that dream after I tried the light switch, I turned around and I started yelling at it. I told it I was not scared of it anymore, and it had no power over me. I was about 10 or 11 when everything started, and I was 16 or 17 when I got to that point, so I was terrorized by it for at least 5 years, if not 6 or 7 years before. I finally had had enough and refused to let it scare me anymore. I knew that was long. I appreciate anyone who takes the time to listen to this, whether you believe it or not. I have written a lot about this. Some of the answers I have written about are experiences as well as even gone into detail about a situation involving my grandmother. Ouija isn't a toy. No child should ever have one, and any parent who thinks it's harmless fun has no idea what they're talking about. If it's put into the hands of someone who is already more open to things of that nature, especially a child, who is, they can and end up with a negative attachment that they didn't ask for. They aren't prepared for and don't know how to get rid of it. I personally think it's hard to believe Hasbro doesn't even know what they're selling. It's not a toy at all. To me, it's been like they know exactly what they're doing and they are intentionally marketing them to children as toys, knowing that children are more open to these types of things than anyone else is. We develop the skills to filter out things as we go. Children don't have a way to filter them yet. I'm sure there's probably a safe way to use them, but... They don't tell you how to use them safely in their instructions. They don't tell you that you can potentially invite evil into your home and life by using them. They don't tell you what to do if that happens. There's so much they don't tell you when you buy one. The only thing they tell you is it's a great game, even though it's not. They lead you to believe it's harmless, fun, even though it's not. They don't tell you that certain people using them in certain locations can potentially be a recipe for disaster. I do hope everyone who hears this story believes it. It's 100% true. But I already know they won't. But that doesn't stop me from telling it in hopes it will prevent someone from going through what I went through. Unfortunately, a lot of people won't listen. It's one of those fuck around and find out situations. My last answer about Ouija, I had someone try and tell me it's just a game. When I said that I told my teenagers, if they ever bring one into my house, I'll burn it and ground them for a month. They said, it's just a game. Let them have their fun. My response to that was, it's not just a game. It's not fun and you haven't lived my life. I find it sad that anyone thinks that way when they have no idea what they're talking about. This is one subject I take very, very seriously.
Over 10 years ago, I opened up a portal in my life in which I may never understand or lose. There are still days that I feel the presence, and I believe I will be perpetually followed by a manifestation of my actions. Even recently, I've begun having a weird habit of almost psychosis-like uncontrollable day thinking. Just go kill yourself. It repeated over the course of just a few days in my head, last month more than 50 times. This happened for things as large as depressive wallowing or as small as forgetting to do anything. I unconsciously form devil horns in my hands every day, have a strange obsession with occult imagery, and the enlightenment eye of Lucifer that you may or may not have noticed propaganded literally everywhere in music. Where's the best place to hide the truth? In plain sight. When I was in high school, I was overweight and drawn to an outsider extremist crowds. We wore black, we listened to death metal, and we caused as much general mayhem as possible, all the while toting a pack of Parliament cigarettes like we were vile Velo halfway through his daily fifth of Jack. In these times, there was one group in which I grew to like, trust, and ultimately subject my innocence and soul. My friends introduced the Ouija board to me as something they really wanted to delve into. When I was persuaded, we didn't just dwell, we dove. I turned away from my Catholic upbringing and began to search for evil so that we could translate that to our experience with the board. This was because our first day plays were typical of a new Ouija board user experience. The board moved very little. We questioned who was even moving in the first place, and we had exhausted our haunted venues. I introduced a satanic mantra to the group, and it was welcome to the table inside of my friend Cody's house. We were getting tired of the effort it took to go into graveyards and abandoned buildings, so his dad's place was going to have to do for now. We put the board on his kitchen table, huddled around it with our hands on the planchette, and chanted the mantra, Archangel, Dark Angel, lend me thy light through death's veil until we have heaven in sight. Six times. Pause. Six times. Pause. Six times. What a bad idea. What an ignition of torment. These are the events as followed from our many experiences with the board after that, with the house that we cursed, and what I've had to deal with since. The board became a hub of life, no matter who touched it, no matter how light we tried to touch it, the board would speak in volumes at a very rapid rate. It would always spell words in their entirety to form whole sentences correctly in English and stable in and out of wonderment and vulgar slandering. For example, the board told me, in 2006, that Obama was going to be president of the United States. This was before any decisions were even made in his own party. It also told me that by 2012, the world will have been destroyed by his actions. It spoke at length about salvation, pointing out that certain friends were to die early and suffer. Those of faith, like myself, and very little of my cohorts, were to possibly see salvation if we changed certain aspects of my life. And yes, it laid our deepest fears of why we wouldn't be able to see heaven on the table. Or... I would have no choice. My biggest worry at the time? How did it know? It also adamantly swore there were friends of mine who were doomed to burn for the rest of eternity who had no chance of heaven no matter what they did. You see, we knew what we were looking to find, what to talk to, a demon or a well-known entity of evil from classic Lucifer to Anton Lavi and Alabaster Crowley. 
and it manifested in ways, various ways, through the board. They told us that the greatest part about hell was being a slave. The worst part about hell was being a slave. Cody loved the adrenaline and ended up buying a new board. With this board, we went even further. This was something hard to fess up to, and even harder to elude to in a confessional as a Catholic to a respected priest. But I still do in light of my soul and personal beliefs. With a new board, I found a backward recording of the Lord's Prayer and let it rip. Oh, the movement. The board would flit between the answers yes and no faster than we could think to stop it. It also became more evil and malevolent in its answering. One day, we invited a host of extra friends. They were friends I knew. We began with the usual questions it shouldn't know the answer to, flipping it off and watching the board spill back, fuck you, and when they had witnessed the power of what we had invoked, a friend named Jordan started to lose his cool. No way is this real. You have to be moving it, he exclaimed in disbelief. Acting like a pompous know-it-all, he took the Bible he had brought for his own peace of mind and plopped it onto the table. Immediately, the planchette sprung into action with one of the most memorable things the board ever communicated. Take the Bible off the table, or else I'll burn the house down, fuckers. It spelled every letter, and we all went nuts. Of course, the house did not burn down after Jordan refused to remove the Bible, but it has gotten us in other ways. Cody's house became a bona fide place of strange. Like I said, I had many groups and this one was full of needy people that mooched off of each other. That being said, there was a constant string of people coming and going, passing out on couches and acting like the place was theirs. Cody's dad worked out of town 90% of the time and that was taken advantage of. One of the kids that always stayed there who played with us regularly stopped wanting to be over there because he would constantly see a staunch white face that would glare at him through the windows. Cody saw little sleep in that house and would wake up in living nightmares, he said. For example, one sleep he awoke in the midst of the night, 3 a.m. is a real supernatural hour, and felt extremely uneasy. Soon, he began to hear haunting moans, which culminated in a mass of hands reaching up and over the bed as if they were going to grab him and pull him into Hades. A good friend of mine, who I stupidly introduced, had the worst visible reaction out of any one of us. We finished a session and were cruising around in my car to rehash the experience. Midway through this, he stops talking to me. I pause for an answer, and in my waiting, I hear an odd breathing. He turns out to be basically panting like a dog. I pull over and go out to go to his side. He was positioned leaning downward in the passenger seat, but had also had one arm up holding the oh shit handle. It was as if he were glued to it, panting and panting. I could only think how strange and stupid his behavior was. When I started to try and help by touching him to get out of the car, he only panted harder. I began to think it couldn't be a joke. This scared the shit out of me, so I drove five minutes across our small town to the Catholic Church. I had no idea what to do, but I had an inkling. I pulled him out of the car and basically spilled him into the sidewalk of the church right in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary, writhed on the pavement, but eventually came to and was extremely disoriented. To this day, I don't know if he was playing a joke on me or if it was real, but it did something to frighten me. In this time, I noticed that I became more withdrawn and spiteful. I hated my classmates and wanted nothing to do with the popular and liked people in our school. 
I began to research the occult and download literature from respected names in evil, such as the aforementioned Alistar, Anton, and H.P. Lovecraft. One day, my mother came down into my room in the basement. She didn't say much, but I could tell she was deeply disconnected. Whatever it is you brought into my house, take it out now. My dreams have become haunted and evil, and I know that it has been you. I never told her anything of what I was doing, but my actions had begun to cause her deeply uncomforting nightmares. It was right at this time I had my very first episode of sleep paralysis. One night, I woke up and could not move. I tried to lift an arm, roll over, and even scream. I could get my body to respond to nothing. I tried to force all of my will and thought into something as simple as just moving a pinky. Nothing. This was similar to my further research into typical sleep paralysis experiences others have had. An oppressing feeling hearing things and seeing what's not there. I saw no figures, but I did have an out-of-body experience, almost lucid dreaming type of experience. While I was laying there, I sort of lost touch with reality and my physical body. I remember sitting up, but also being conscious that I had never moved and that my body was still laying down. While sitting, my soul turned towards the doorway to the basement room I lived in. I gazed across the floor to the doorway, where through that should have been a set of seven stairs that led straight up and out of the basement. I couldn't make out the doorway. I couldn't make out the stairs. That area of the room to me was a pitch black hole, like the black cloud of Mora from Skyrim. A moving, breathing black cloud. Around me, the hue of the room was light twilight like gray, so it was easy to see that where the doorway should have been was not what was there at all. I felt supreme fear, but I still stared. When I finally got back to sitting forward and laid down flat, I was suddenly able to move my body again, like someone grasping back to life after receiving CPR. I deleted all of the occult literature I had downloaded the next day. Fast forward three years, and I'm a teenager at Gonzaga University as a freshman. It was a great time, but to stay relevant, it was also a time I grew to expect haunting nightmares of my own. More than once, I would wake up in my bed as if it were me actually waking up. But immediately, I would notice that the crucifix in the room which I never even had, would be hanging crooked, not just awkwardly, but at a hard, almost right angle. I knew that a crucifix that doesn't hang straight is indication of a supernatural presence. I would get up feeling anxious, but wanting to connect with someone else to know what was going on. Whenever I found my friends or loved ones in these dreams, the same occurrence would take place. They would express deep concern for me and approach to see what was wrong, but when I exposed my face and tried to speak, it would come out as the deepest, most inhuman bellow. Imagine the MGM lion's growl for whatever I was trying to say. When this happened in my dreams, my friends and family would literally fall over themselves in horror, trying to get away from me. When I was abandoned and longing, my dream self would be flung to my back and I would experience an unnatural presence on my chest. Whether this is a possessing experience or part of my nightmares, I don't know. But I've had this type of dream at least five times in my life. Throughout the years, I feel a presence that follows me and it haunts me wherever I turn to God or strive to become involved in a holier lifestyle. There was a climactic time for me in 2014, where all of my past flooded back to become a renewed source of haunting. I accidentally ingested a foot spray that was very toxic in my apartment and almost passed out from this. I was lightheaded, disoriented, and far from all there, putting me in a very vulnerable state. 
I was also scared that I might pass out and never wake up, so I jumped in the car to get myself to the hospital, come hell or high water. A trip to the hospital meant that I needed my insurance card, which was at work. I remember only feeling hazy on that drive there. For some reason, I swore that card was there and that I just had to have it for the ER. I pulled up right outside of the building and went into the lobby to call the elevator. At that time, I worked for one of the largest real estate firms in the state as an agent. My broker was a micromanaging freak, so the office was made up of many offices in one large space. The catch was that each individual's office were made up of all glass walls. Our broker just had to be able to make sure everyone was always working. What that meant for me during my delusional visit was that the office was full of bright lights from passing cars on the road, twinkling like a kaleidoscope setting in the right light. This was extremely disconcerting. I found my desk, almost frightened from the silent and twinkling office, and dug through where I thought I had my card. It wasn't there. Could I have doubted myself and left it in my car this whole time? Around the time I had this revelation, I felt a most threatening presence growing behind me, in the corner of the room. I turned just in time to see a mass of unstoppable black, which seemed to be growing to envelop my body and a feeling of hate directed toward me. I tripped over myself out of the office. I didn't shut any of the doors, my desk, the hall, the exit, and ran out. I knew the front door locked itself, so I didn't even think twice about it. The last thing I heard on the way out was the hall door upstairs clicking innocently shut. I made it to the hospital and was nursed back to health. At this time, my romantic long-distance relationship went sour. I knew she was going behind my back, and this caused a huge part of our downfall. But another portion came from what she claimed to hear and feel. She was more than a hundred miles away, but was haunted by dragging sounds outside of her room and evil inside the house. One night, she called me and asked if I were still home. I was at home by myself, far away. She was freaking out about the dragging sound in her living room, which I couldn't claim responsibility for or explain. She was talking to me when all of a sudden I lost her on the other end of the phone. I could still hear her breathing, but she disappeared for minutes. Then she was back, whimpering, and had been gone long enough to freak me out. She even went as far as to have the house blessed with sage by medium. This was completely against my Catholic upbringing and it almost killed my cat because of how outlandishly he reacted trying to exit the house through a screen window during that process. That was five feet in the air. The medium, in their first encounter, told her that I am haunted because of what I have done in my past. I had never told her about my Ouija experience before. She was extremely judgmental and close-minded. From that experience, she came to me asking questions about things she had no business knowing, like satanic music that had taken its toll, that there was a certain lyric that I had heard that had brought this upon me. I knew instantly what it was, our satanic mantra. I still try to make it to church. I'm in a relationship in which I'm in love now, and none of this matters because I am supported and feel strength in many aspects. I still confess to my Ouija use in the confessional, and I wish for it to go away. Will it return again to haunt me? It's hard to deny a dark trend of darkness, even through the greatest efforts to return to the light. Disclaimer. This is all a personal experience. There's nothing made up or embellished here because it's not necessary. That being said, this is written from an all but psychological experience, as you have heard. 
Nothing extraordinary or outlandish is described physically. The night I recalled this and wrote this memory in its entirety three years ago, police and paramedics came into my house at 3 a.m. My brother's drunk friend got paranoid, had a panic attack, and called 911 when they got home and while I was sleeping. Coincidence again? Beware the occult. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special thank you to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Tammy Clayton, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Kwame Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the channel. I appreciate you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourself out there and stay safe. I'll be reading to you soon. Peace, love, and light to you all.